What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can find me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Much more importantly, I am joined once again by the one and only Mike Wall. Mike, it has been a hot second since we've had a chance to talk. Last time we talked, we were wondering what was going to happen with Aaron Rodgers. Would Devontae Adams get a franchise tag? Just a few things have gone on in the NFL since we've talked last. So first of all, how are you doing? And then we will get to Aaron Rodgers after that. And it was good to see you. I'm doing great. Uh, yeah, it's been a lot of action. We were just uh, discussing some of this stuff offline. It's 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 tough to imagine where these numbers have gone and what the ramifications of some of these moves that are being made right now are going to have for some of these teams. But uh, but please proceed. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's been an absolutely insane bananas off season, no matter what way you look at it. And it's like, there's, a, there's like guys like Tyron Matthew and a lot of really good free agents that are still left on the market. We have a full NFL draft still. And that's why NFL is king. Like the stuff that goes on is just beyond crazy. Russell Wilson's traded Tom Brady's back. We could go in a million different directions with all of this. But of course, as we talked about last time, we were wondering if Aaron Rodgers was going to come back. I know for most people, of course, listening, this has been a topic that's been discussed ad nauseum up to this point, but I would be remiss not to ask you your thoughts on Rodgers coming back and what that means for the Packers this year and moving forward. Well, it just simply means that they're still in the hunt to win a Super Bowl, right? Yeah. Very, very, very at the most basic level, they made a decision like we talked about before. If they get rid of Aaron Rodgers, everybody in that building is on all of a sudden a, a rolling clock, right? Like their, their contracts are all expiring too because you're not going to – most likely you're not going to hit it a third time in a row with a Hall of Fame caliber quarterback. And, you know, we, we don't know what Jordan Love is, but we know he's not Aaron Rodgers. And so – very simply. And so do you want to take a chance on rebuilding around Jordan Love or – do you want to move all your chips to the middle of the table and go, I think we have a window of two or three years here with Aaron Rodgers to win the Super Bowl. Let's do everything we can because we know that that is immortality, not only in Green Bay, but also in the, in the rest of the NFL. If you can win that, if you're good against, if you're, if you're Coach LaFleur, if you win that Super Bowl, you have a street named after you. You are, you are NFL immortality and NFL royalty all of a sudden. So that's what I, you know, at the, at the basic level, you just go, this is a very simple thing. Now, can we execute it? I'm glad they got it done because it seemed to be for a while we were, we were touch and go there. But I think most of us assumed it was going to be the you know, turn out the way it did. Yeah, very much. So. And you bring up a great point. I've, I've made mention of this before, but it's worth mentioning again. Like to me, I, I leaned a little bit towards like it would be really cool if Green Bay could get, you know, a bunch of first round picks and maybe get some salary cap relief and then do the trade for Adams and just sort of start fresh and get sort of out of some of the salary cap stuff. It is a million times easier for me to say that in front of a computer screen um, and uh, and talking about it on a podcast than it is for a GM and a head coach and a general manager, like all of them, um, salary cap guru, uh, to make that decision when as soon as you do it, like you said, it's a rolling clock for everyone. Everyone's on notice from that point forward because, yeah, draft picks sound nice, but if you don't get the next guy coming in, I mean, look at the Indianapolis Colts, right? As soon as Andrew Luck is gone, and I know that was a different circumstance, but but you go for a new quarterback every single year since then. I mean, the Cleveland Browns have gone, what, since the inception of their franchise, um, after they, they moved to Baltimore and got a new team, they have yet to find a quarterback. We'll see if it obviously happens now with Deshaun Watson, but it is not easy to do. And it, again, draft picks and in, uh, in, in salary cap space sounds great on paper, but if you can't execute it, again, you're, you're on a yeah, ticking time clock. Yeah, for sure. And you just saw the Rams with less needs t-shirt, you know, after the draft picks <laughs> and they just won the Super Bowl. So, I mean, it's like the currency is different in, in this day and age in the NFL. Yep. You think about Bill Belichick's probably, you know, he's, he's he the only guy he replaced Tom Brady with Mac Jones. And so far it seems to be at least the point they're trending in the right direction. I'm not saying they're going to get back to the Super Bowl, but they're trending. The right. He has a plan and he's the smartest guy in the league. The other guy I would look at right now is, you know, Pete Carroll's about to go through this right now, but Pete Carroll started with the same, philosophy that he's going back into free agency now and I think that relationship with Russell Wilson on both sides it seemed like it you know had kind of worn thin yep. it was time to reboot but he's going back to his philosophy of we're going to treat this like you we did at USC we're going to bring in young guys that want to change the game we're going to we're going to practice hard we're going to play him early we're going to let him make mistakes and hopefully we have a future hall a couple of future hall of famers like we did the last time we went around with Bobby with Earl with Cam Chancellor with Richard Sherman right with Russell in a third round draft pick. So he's really the, when I look at it, like if you don't have that cachet, if you don't, and he has the ring and he had, you know, he can, he can kind of go through this and go, I, my clock's probably pretty good for a couple of years. If you're not that guy, I don't know that you can, 
you can really make that decision to go away from an Aaron Rodgers talent or forget it, even a top five or top seven talent. I don't yeah. know if you can do that. No, I agree. And, and as we know, too, you know, Green Bay is, is not the best free agent destination in the world. Aaron Rodgers mentioned it. So, you know, perfectly last year, it's not exactly a vacation destination. Um, and if you need to attract quarterback, whatever position it is, if you're not developing those guys through the draft and keeping them when you have them, um, it can make it very difficult to find guys. Now we'll see, maybe this is a perfect way to transition to wide receiver, because of course we had a pretty crazy Devonte Adams trade as well. And now green Bay's left in that room with not much at wide receiver, Randall Cobb, Amari Rogers, Alan Lazard, really the top of the list right now. Uh, but what were your thoughts on that Devonte Adams trade, what green Bay got in return and where they might go at wide receiver moving forward. I love the trade. Honestly. Um, if, if the guy doesn't want to be there, uh, it, it, with a guy that, listen, we talked about this before. Devontae Adams has done everything he can for the Green Bay Packers. Uh, and if, if the guy approaches you and says, I'm asking for something that you're not willing to give, or maybe he just wanted to go play with his boy or just wants to change his, whatever it is. Like, I, I look at it from this perspective. If I'm Devontae Adams, and I don't know, the last two years, Aaron Rodgers have been waffling about his future. So even if he signs this deal, I don't know that he's coming back for one year, for two yes. years, three if I think I have three to five years of, of really high productivity left in my career and I want to be a Hall of Fame player, which I, I from what everything I've been told, the way he behaves, the way he works, that's what the suggestion is. Yeah. I can't sit here and hope that Aaron plays for another five years or three years or whatever it is. I, I have to make some assumptions. And doing so, you go with Derek Carr, you have that familiarity. You have weapons all over the field on that, uh, that Las Vegas Raiders team. I mean, they're stacked from a skill position standpoint. And so for me, being able to get back all that draft capital puts us in a good position. You don't have to eat that contract that you were willing to pay, but now you can kind of kind of point that to some other places because you can get probably three. We just looked at it. You can get at least two really good receivers for what they're paying Devontae. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think to me, everything, every decision in the NFL is like a trade, right? It may not look like a trade on paper, but it's like, you have to take everything into the equation. And to me, and I know, um, you know, good friend, Jake Morley, who's on the audio version of the podcast has been pointing this out as well, but it's, it's not just trading a first and a second for Devonte Adams. It's a first and second and all that salary cap space that you have to be able to spend. And we've already seen Green Bay use that in a variety of ways with Rizul Douglas, with Jerron Reed. You could probably even argue that the Devondre Campbell uh, situation probably fits itself better in there because of the Devonte Adams trade as well. You know, if you're going out and getting and they're they're going to add a wide receiver, like I, I would just be beyond shocked, whether that's MVS, whether that's a free agent, whether that's via trade. I would just be beyond shocked if they go into the April draft without having some other veteran wide receiver on the roster. Um, they're going to have all of those players in large part due to the fact that they saved that money by not having Devonte on the, on the salary cap. So um, there's a lot that goes into it. It's not just the first and second, it's all the salary cap space as well. And again, Green Bay's already made great use of some of that space by getting some of their own guys back. Yeah, certainly. And you think about, you know, the drafts coming up, they just signed Tony back to a one-year pro like kind of a prove it deal yeah. coming off an injury. So Mercedes Lewis that they have a new, uh, they have a new tight ends coach in the, in the room. They have to develop that position because they need to be able to go 12 personnel, whether it's Lewis and DeGuara. Tanya's more of a wide receiver. That's he's he's not really a willing blocker. So they need to develop somebody in that room that can be more of a two-way player. That'll be huge in this offense with AJ Dillon and Aaron Jones in the backfield. Like having that, those weapons, you need to be able to utilize 12 personnel a little bit more. But if you look at what we really need, you, like you said, Cobb, and then you know, you kind of look at every every wave of Aaron's career, there's been a, a receiver that he has at least helped somewhat ascend to the highest level right now we would all look at Lazard and go probably him right because he's invaluable we had AJ Dillon on the podcast AJ was saying he might be their MVP because of all the dirty work he's willing to do in addition to being the deep threat and all this so he could be a guy that develops into that number one receiver they can bring in a veteran uh, via probably via trade at this point just kind of looking down the, the line at, at who's available and what what that really looks like as far as do we want to rely on that um, with Aaron's, I would just look at it like this, like draft capital's currency right now. And I don't know that Aaron Rodgers is looking at a rookie situation. Well, there's probably not a Jamar Chase in this draft that we're going to get. Right. So there's probably not a situation where he's looking at it like, yeah, I want to develop a rookie. But if we can bring in a third-year guy, a fifth-year guy that's healthy, 
and can kind of just kind of fit into the system. Aaron's a force multiplier. He makes everybody around him better. We know this to be fact. We know it in the in the wide receiver room alone, all the all the stars that he's made, all the tens of millions of dollars in contract money that he's helped those guys earn. So there's no reason to think we're, it's going to be any different this year. No, I totally agree. And we've seen Aaron be successful in games without Devontae Adams and be able to spread the ball around. Um, you know, I think it's going to be interesting, as you mentioned, you know, if there are rookies that are brought in with, you know, via the plethora of first and second, third round picks that they now have, you know, how quickly are they able to get engaged with Aaron Rodgers? We know it's a very demanding situation. MBS has gone on record as saying there's basically two offenses that you need to learn Matt LaFleur's offense and then Aaron Rodgers' offense at the line of scrimmage. Um, he wants very detailed and precise route running and know exactly where you're going to be. There's a lot that goes into it. So um, just taking somebody in the first round, if they're not going to be the nuanced route runner, if they're not going to be, you know, great with the attention to detail, even if it is a Jamar chase, like there's going to take a, a ramp up period. Right. So um, I'm very interested to see what direction they go. I agree with you, whether it's again, probably via trade, whatever that they add some sort of veteran. Um, I, I think that's probably the right way to go, but either way, it's going to be really interested to see how they fill out this wide receiver roster. Yeah. And you just think about what is something that goes unnoticed with Devonte Adams is his work ethic and probably the level of assimilation that goes on in that room for people to start to gravitate to the way he does business. And when you talk about there's two different offenses or just the precision in his route running, like him and Hunter Renfo, arguably the top two route runners in the entire league on the same team now. Right. But that's probably one of those things, because we don't know what kind of, I mean, with a lot of the guys on the new staff, except for Stenovich, I really don't know who's a great development coach there. I really don't because it's not like, you know, the, whoever the wide receivers could, I don't, sorry, I don't even know who it is, but he, he didn't make Devonte Adams. Matt LaFleur didn't make Aaron Rodgers, right? I mean, you just start looking at all these players and go, okay, well, who can really develop talent in that room? And what it usually is, is a combination of having a good room with a good coach, but having that leader in that room. Can Randall Cobb be that guy at this point in his career? Is he going to put in the, the work and understand that, you're getting paid not only to be here and produ be productive on the field, but to make sure that these younger guys understand exactly what it takes to be an Aaron Rodgers wide receiver. That's going to go a long ways in determining the success of whoever comes in, maybe even more so than, than we realize, because I think Devontae Adams, he, he presented himself and people present him as that guy. No, the, and we've talked about before too, right? They, they have a veteran in every room. And even with Cobb, they still have that, whether it's Rogers at quarterback, Aaron Jones now at running back, you've got Cobb at wide receiver, Mercedes Lewis at tight end, Bakhtiari on the offensive line, uh, Preston Smith on the edge, Kenny Clark now on the defensive line, Devondre at linebacker, Jair, it's probably what I, it's still, you know, the veteran guy now at corner. And then uh, at safety, you've got Amos, right? So like they've had Crosby on special, like they've had some sort of veteran in pretty much every one of their rooms. And that seems to be something that they want to accomplish. So they're just not going into a season with a, a room full of young players. Even last year, when it seemed like they were heading in that direction, they pick up Devondre Campbell at linebacker in the last minute. Of course, that works out perfectly. So um, I think they've done a really good job of that. Of Again, you know, Matt LaFleur's made this a players led team um, in a variety of different ways too. And it makes it a lot easier when you have a veteran like that in each of the rooms. But to your point, and people are going to get sick of me talking about this. My, one of my favorite things every season is watching Devante work at training camp, like the attention to detail that he has and how he practices. Like there's a few, like Bakhtiari's that way, Jair Alexander's that way, but Devante Adams is probably one a where I just, I, I can't stop watching the guy because everything that he does, he does with intensity, with a purpose. And there's a reason why he's become such an artist at his position. He's just, it's a joy to watch him work. Isn't it funny that you just mentioned arguably the three best non-quarterback offensive or offensive defensive players on the team. And they're the hardest workers. Like it, it's always so. It's it's just, it's such a it's it's the answers to the test are available to everyone. And this is the thing that just it blows my mind with any I guess anything we do that's competitive, but professional sports, the answers to the test are right in front of you. And it's amazing how many people don't still don't want to take those answers and, and put them into practice. It's just absolutely amazing. You see, you see a guy like Bakhtiari, Jair Alexander. You see a guy like Devonte work and work and work and perfect their craft and put their heart and soul into it for the limited amount of time, the finite amount of time they have to be a pro. And you just wonder, and I can just tell you from my playing days, you just wonder, man, why aren't you guys doing this? Like what, what, what's missing? What, what, why is there, is there not this connection? And uh, that's why there's such a discrepancy. Now I was talking on a podcast this morning, 
there really is a discrepancy between the top players in the NFL and kind of the rest of the herd. I think there's a discrepancy or a gap now between those two that's larger than it has been in my lifetime, my, my time watching uh, watching football and participating in football, just because the haves and the have nots and the separation between professionalism and just kind of being average has just, that's this, this standard is, is too easy for guys to trip over. Right. It's not a hurdle. They have to jump over. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a step they have to trip over now. No, it's interesting you bring that up. Cause I agree. I've said for a couple of years now of like, and I also, not only is there the gap between the haves and the have nots, but like the difference between like a, an average player and like your below average to me, isn't as much anymore. Like there's just not many guys that are just like, so like, you. so you've got like this whole group of people of like that, that your difference between the guy that you're paying like 8 million for, and the guy that's like on a undrafted free agent deal is less than it's been. And then the guy that's like from here to like your next upper echelon is huge. Um, and that's why I've said like, I'm not so concerned about bringing in like some of these vet minimum guys. And again, it can pay off. Obviously, Rizul Douglas, Devondre Campbell are phenomenal examples of that. But that's almost like my reverse of like why it's so hard to lose a Devonte Adams, because when you do get one of those guys in your building and because there is such a gap between the next group, like you, you really want to hang on to those again, whether it's a Hall of Fame caliber player or whatever. Again, I agree with the deal, getting the two picks, the salary cap space to build the overall roster. But um, I, it, on the flip side, you really want to hang on to those guys that are in the upper echelon and Devonte is clearly one of them. I'll give you a, I'll give you a quick, funny story. So I'm working with these guys, these pro guys, right? And I bring my son. My son is 12 years old at the time. And so we're working out, working out. And we have five or six offensive linemen there. And we get back in the car and he goes, he goes, dad, player A is like 40%, 30% better than everybody else there. And I go, yeah. And I go, so I go, so what, what do you think that means? And he goes, well, he goes, well, how much do all of them make? And then I said, well, the other five players make around this. And player A makes like five times that. And he goes, so if you're 30 or 40% better, you make five times more money. And I go, that's pretty much how it's playing out right now. Yeah. Right. And he goes, well, why aren't they working? Because he, you know, player A was more intense. Player A was more dialed in. Like it was just, it was, he was more professional. And my 12 year old sees it. Yeah. And he, he just goes, well, why aren't they all just act like player A? And I go, <laughs> I, I wish know. I knew. Well, it's such a great topic of conversation right now, because of course we have the NFL draft coming up. We just finished the scouting combine. We get inundated with all of these numbers and 40 times and everything like that. And if it were as easy as that, if just the most highly athletic player who was the most gifted was just going to be the best every time. All right. Then it takes a lot of the mystery out of the process, but it's usually far from the case. Now, if you have those athletic traits and you can team it with um, you know, high end effort and energy, then yeah, look the heck out. Those are going to be your top of the top of the top, but um, it's very rarely the guy it's usually guys that are maybe somewhere in the middle, maybe a little bit higher than average, but that have the insane work ethic and intensity. Um, a guy like Devonte Adams, who again, has some really clear athletic traits, but you're not seeing him just burn by guys down the field with a four two forty. like he's doing it with nuance and route running and everything else. Like it, it, it's just, it's so interesting, especially this type of, this time of year to talk about that. Yeah. And, and uh, one thing that's happening a lot more now, you actually see at the wide, wide receiver position, running back position a lot, is they're getting personal coaches. Like they're getting people that teach them how to come in and out of breaks, how to cut, how to be more explosive and reactive in game situations. You see those offensive linemen now too. They'll get people to work with them, defensive linemen as well. And the people that are putting that extra resource and extra time in are finding outlier, you know, outlier worth success. And so I get to your point, when you look at the draft, like I was just looking, you know, somebody asked me to look at the, the offensive tackles that are coming up. There's, a, there's really three guys that are arguably top 10 picks, top, top 15 picks. And the guy that is like a no brainer to me is the Charles Cross guy. And he's, he's usually ranked third. And well, why the other guys are 340, 350 pounds. I said, well, cause Charles Cross has the best feet and it's not even close. And, and the other, you know, the, 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 the overriding um, kind of talk out there is that, Oh, well, he'll get to an NFL locker room and the NFL coaches will like teach Mold these on. other guys how to, how to move better. And I go, what? They're saying they're teaching the same stuff their college guys did. Like, what are you talking about? Like, there's there's no the process is the same. So one guy, maybe he just had a better coach, or you know, or he has better natural footwork, or he has more attention to detail, whatever the reason is, he's already from a footwork standpoint, kind of NFL ready. Now there's some other stuff he has to work on, but 
I can like build up body armor. I can help you become a better hip hinge guy. But if you're, if your footwork's poor compared to the, to compared to your, your peers, that's something in the NFL, unless you go and look for outside help, it's going to be really hard for you to fix because they don't spend a lot of time on it. I love the, uh, once they get to the NFL, like once they get to the NFL, you know what NFL coaches are focused on winning. <laughs> like yeah. it get like they'd say quickly transitions to like, we got to get ready for our week one opponent. And it's not the same off season that it used to be where you were running to and it, for the better, probably that you're running two a days and like working on technique. I know some of that stuff happens clearly, but like it so quickly gets to, we got to prepare for week one and our opponent week one. And, and, you know, you're on the scouting team and like everything else. Like, I just don't feel like that same level of development happens, which is also why I feel like the Rams and other teams are starting to prioritize veterans who are in year five, six, seven, eight, who've already had the experiences and know how to play right now, rather than a rookie who they have to come in and spend three to four years trying to develop to get to the point that those guys already are at. It'll be really interesting to see, because I think, you know, we're a copycat league. So the Rams just had a, a, a ton of success doing this. And now you see the Bengals went and, dra- and brought in three offensive linemen. Yep. Now we've talked about this before. As an offensive lineman, as an offensive group, we can tell if you're well coached, whether you can, if you can handle double teams and you can pass off games, right? That's just a very easy, that's a very vanilla way for me to say, okay, that room can actually develop talent. Now they couldn't do that last year. So you can bring in these guys and we can talk about how they're glass eaters and this and that and the other thing. I'll be really interested, interested to see how that goes because I don't know if you're just covering up the problem or not. As far as are you, are you still going to develop the talent in that room? What will be super interesting, I think, from the Rams standpoint is because it is a copycat league, is do we start seeing either teams or individual coaches on other teams that are going to be like the feeder programs for the, for the top eight clubs? Yeah. I would not be shocked at all if you look at like, let's just say Callahan, although Callahan's in a different realm, but like Bill Callahan's one of the best offensive line coaches in the league for the Cleveland Browns. I wouldn't be shocked if somebody in the Cleveland, if Cleveland continues to not be good. If, if one of these teams just starts going, Hey man, we're going to try to take every single free agent. I don't care if he's a starter or a second team guy, we're going to take them from Cleveland because we know Bill Callahan can develop talent. Yeah. It could easily happen. And you see all the time where a guy will go through a change of scenery after being with a poor organization, top pick, didn't work out in his first spot, goes to a winning organization and you know, voila, you've got a winning player. I mean, to some extent, not exactly because it's not like Atlanta and, and Arizona are just brutal, brutal franchises, but Devondre Campbell, right? He goes, spends four years in Atlanta, just doesn't fit perfectly, had all the talent, the upsides, the size, the strength. As I mentioned, he's like a scout's wet dream at inside linebacker of what you're looking at. And then you get him in the right situation. Joe Barry, defensive coordinator, gives him the spotlight and he shines. And there's a lot that goes into that. Could have just been, you know, he started to play better. Who knows? But um, it certainly wouldn't be the first or last case that that happens. I do want to transition, though, to offensive line since we're talking about it already from a Packers standpoint. I know one of the few things I think you and I have maybe slightly disagreed on has been the play of Billy Turner, which again, I yield to you because you know way more about the offensive line position than I do. Um, But Billy Turner released from Green Bay. Um, They have a gap at right tackle, maybe Yash Nyman. Curious your thoughts on potentially moving him there and where you kind of view Green Bay's offensive line and where they stand right now. Yeah, I I didn't really even think about Yash being the, uh, being the, the next right tackle for the Green Bay Packers. When I look at it, I, you know, Bakhtiari is going to be back. Yep. Jenkins is not going to be necessarily be back at the beginning of the year, but he'll, we'll assume he'll be back some at point. some point. Yep. Um, Myers is going to be a stalwart at, at center. Yep. John Runyon Jr. to me is the person who won a job last year. So he's a, he's a full-time starter. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Now, yep. the, now the question becomes, excuse me, how much do they value the right tackle position? do they value it enough to move Jenkins over there? Or do they still think that he's, you know, being that left guard and that left side being dominant, is that more important being, you know, being the blind side, being the guys that can get those double teams and all the yeah. things that they do from a, a trap and pull standpoint. Cause Jenkins could probably play that position and play it at a high level, high enough level to, to be successful. But, you know, for me, that means they move John Rennie Jr. over to right guard. Um, and that means that uh, it, you, you have some gaps Right. And is Josh Nyman, is that, is he more of a, is he more of a right now? Do we look at him like a swing tackle position? Yeah. Or, or, 
That's how I see him I right agree. now, right now. Right. But at the same time, depending on how they want to run their offense, if they're going to line up a tight end next to that right tackle more often than not, um, they could, they could just find a big body and, 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 and put it in there and then have somebody develop into it. They can pick up a guy in the draft. I mean, right tackle is one of those positions we've seen rookies come in and do well at. So that's, that's certainly an opportunity as well. But um, I would think that, I guess I, j- I just, for some reason feel like they're probably going to move Jenkins over there. If they do put Yasha there and give him a chance, um, I hope he does well. He's, you know, he proved that he can play. I just don't know that if he proved that he's going to be dominant coming into this year. I agree. I think I, I think there's a decent chance that it starts the season until Jenkins is back where you go Bakhtiari, Runyon, Myers, and then probably Royce Newman, and then Yash at right tackle to just kind of kick things off. And then as soon as um, Elton's back, you just put Elton in at right tackle and let Yash yeah. go back to being a swing tackle. Um, probably develop some depth either via veteran signing or via the draft um, to fill in some of those spots as well. Maybe bring in competition for Yash in the interim and training camp, whether again, that be via veteran or uh, or our draft pick, we'll see. But um, I, I just feel like they're probably going to have to pay Elton Jenkins a significant amount of money at some point to, to keep him on the team, right? And I know you can pay guards. Uh, I certainly respect that position, Mike. Uh, but um, right tackle, if you're going to pay a guy, there's a lot more value in paying a top tier right tackle um, than potentially a guard. So it um, could be beneficial for Elton and could be beneficial for Green Bay in that standpoint. That's blasphemy. But, well, I know. I'm sorry. I, it's absolute blasphemy. Here, here's something that Royce Newman, there's an, here's a guy that it's interesting to talk about because he went to a school that develops offensive linemen. Yep. Right. So he, so he's a guy that comes in into the, what we were, the point we were making earlier, he's kind of got the footwork and, and understands the angles. He's kind of an NFL ready guy. He just doesn't have an NFL ready body. So he's the kind of guy that he, his leap from if, if he works this off season and builds some body armor and works on his athleticism and continues to develop technically, he's a guy that can make a huge leap, right? Maybe more so than anybody else on that line. Totally agreed. And I think, I think sometimes the second year jump gets overplayed a little bit, but I do think in a player like that, where they have the technique, but maybe just not the physical traits that you need and can spend an off season in the NFL weight room and everything like that, that is exactly the, the picture perfect type of player that can benefit from that first off season in the NFL and at legitimately take a leap. Because as you mentioned, he has the um, you know, he has the, uh, just the wherewithal and the footwork and everything to make it work, even though he didn't have all those athletic traits last year. We're going to have to take another, uh, session sometime and, and argue the, the points of, uh, a really valuable left guard versus a right tackle. That is absolute nonsense. You, uh, you <laughs> arguing, uh left, left guard over right tackle. <laughs> oh man. I don't, in this day and age, I think that geometry of the game and everything, I think that's a no brainer, but that's just me. No, I mean, okay. So you've got an Aaron Donald, right? We can, we can spend a minute on it now, but we've got an Aaron Donald. We've got a, you know, the, the quickest way to the quarterback is right. uh, from point A to point B going through the interior of the offensive line. I think guard has been more valuable now than it's ever been. Um, I just, I also see the NFL still valuing tackles over guards um, for right or wrong. Um, but I, I, I don't disagree with you at all in that regards. Well, I, I just, here's the only thing I'll say about it. The, the top two NFL pass rushers of all time were left defensive ends because that right tackle position wasn't very good at pass protection. Sure. So I think that pendulum swung and kind of overcompensated to value that position just because they weren't very good. Now you got to remember because of the shotgun offense and how far back quarterbacks drop now, it's actually a little bit easier for tackles, which I know sounds odd, but because they're so far back, it's easier to run them back because there's so much room to step up. If your guards and center can hold the line, right? So just because of the geometry of the game and having some real studs on the defensive tackle right now, like I think there's more valuable defensive tackles in the game right now than defensive ends. No, I, I don't I disagree with that either. And I think either, again, A, winning from closest from point A to point B, just getting through, again, whether you're an Aaron Donald or one of those guys that can have immediate penetration, or even if you're a guy that's a little bit more of a slow burn that's going to collapse the pocket, then that's when the edge rushers can make their money, right? Because like you said, if it's easy for a guy to get around the edge, but if there's just an easy place to step up in the, I mean, that's a Tom Brady one-on-one, right? He doesn't care if your edge rushers are coming around all day. He can maneuver in that little pocket forever and never have to worry about those edge rushers screaming off the edge. And here's, here's something that people don't talk about too much. Most teams now, and I shouldn't say most, a lot of teams against these mobile quarterbacks, they have rush plans. And, and a lot of times those rush plans 
isolates either the left or right defensive end as saying, you need to get to this spot, like level with the quarterback and start pushing in. We're not, we're not going to run the edge. We're not going to do all these other things. And it kind of takes away the value of that player for that game. So I'll give you an example. When I was with Miami, we we're playing the bills, Tyrod Taylor. We knew that he liked to escape to his left. So he liked to roll out and escape to his left. So our, our right defensive end would have to go up to level and he couldn't pass rush. He would just have to, against a, against a big boy, he would just have to start bullying him. And it takes him out of the entire game from a statistic standpoint. Like you, it's not that you have the day off at left tackle, but your day just got a lot easier. No, for sure. And I, I think at times, you know, when, when people would see Aaron Rodgers have a ton of time in the pocket, there was a lot of that going on where they, like when he was at his point at his peak, where he would just step up in the pocket, move right by time, and then either, you know, be able to scramble out or just buy as much time and make big plays. Like you would legitimately see teams where they weren't even necessarily trying to, to get around and rush the passer because they were just so adamant on not creating those passing lanes that at times your Bakhtiaris, your Bulagas, who are phenomenal tackles, is not disrespect to them at all, but they were just kind of like holding those guys there because those guys didn't want to overcommit, come around, and then have Rodgers in escape alley. Um, and you could see them sort of like what, mud rushing, like it, if there's a lot that goes into that you're a million percent right let's talk about uh one final thing before we get out and i don't even know where to take this the offseason has been crazy calvin ridley suspended tom brady back russell wilson traded baker mayfield in no man's land we talked about christian kirk getting an insane deal i the floor is yours mike wall what's something that you would like to rant or rave or talk about okay well, let's let's talk about the uh the calvin ridley thing Okay, right? that was, that's because actually all, where I wanted to go. So that's perfect. Yeah, because because all of us are like sponsored by Bet Online or ESPN's got uh, you know, the betting apps and everything now. And I just felt you like there's two things that just drive me insane about this. One, the hypocrisy of the National Football League. And I know there's rule like we can all well he signed the rules, blah blah blah. Like, okay, fair enough. But here's what just drives me insane. I don't know the guy. He might be a nice guy. I don't know. He spent fifteen hundred dollars which is insane. That's like me buying you French fries. Okay. <laughs> he lost $11 million yep. for $1,500 parlay bet. And this guy, it drives me insane. You don't have the smarts, the, the just the street smarts, the intel, anything that makes you go, Hey, place this bet for me. Why would you place the bet yourself? I just like it. I know we're I know we're saying oh you shouldn't be doing it anyway tisk tisk whatever, oh my god yeah fifteen hundred dollars dude do you have a girlfriend a brother an uncle anybody could anybody place the bet for you except for yourself because you know they caught him because it was an out of state it was an out of state bet because he, he bet in the state of Florida and you just go I mean it was that is the most I feel so bad for the guy because it's eleven million dollars yeah and. It could have easily, in so many ways, he could have not done it, but it could have so many easily been avoided. Unbelievable. Yeah, no, I, I a million percent get the hypocrisy of the NFL. Um, I do understand why it's one of their harshest penalties. The optics of it are terrible when you've got other players who have done far more serious real life things that are not getting the same level of suspensions, which we don't have to totally go into, but um, the optics of that are clearly not great. Um but yeah, the whole thing of just not being able to have the wherewithal and the mindset to maybe work the system a little bit or whatever, it, the whole thing is crazy. And now he misses out on a year in the NFL, $11 million contract. And who knows after that? Just absolutely crazy. That's that's tough. Right. <laughs> Mike, phenomenal stuff. I appreciate you as always. Uh, we will have to do this again soon. Anything you got working or uh, in the hopper that we can go over or plug for you? Hey, well, so I, uh, I'm actually just switching my website over. So all I've automated all of my, uh, so I have a coaching development series. I call it perpetual, perpetual mastery, uh, excuse me, perpetual supremacy coaching series. And then our total athlete development platform. Uh, I'm switching this stuff over. It should be live tomorrow on process to perform.com. So anybody out there who's interested in either coach development or player development, you can go on there. Our system's completely automated, um, videos, interaction. It should be pretty cool. You are constantly grinding. I absolutely love it. Love everything that you're doing. Everyone that's listening, make sure to go check that out. Make sure to follow Mike on Twitter at Mike Wall 68 or just at Mike Wall. At Mike Wall, she's at Mike Wall 68. That's right. That's what I thought. All right. At Mike Wall 68. You can follow the podcast at Packaday Podcast. That does oh, it. Oh, one us. more thing. I yeah. just Andy, I just put out a I just put out a five rules of skill development. Uh it's on YouTube. I think I put out a link on Twitter. 
check it out. Just let me see what you think about it because um, a lot of people have asked me that question specifically. Yeah, yeah we'll put the link uh, in the uh, in the YouTube uh, you know description as well, so people can check that out. So. Thanks again, Mike. Always appreciate it. For those listening, we'll be right back here tomorrow with an all new episode. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.